you can find virtually anything in, online if you're willing to put in the time to look for it and you know how to do it. It can get complicated. But I found bits and pieces of a police detective's report, New York police detective's report, on the murder of Philip Mangano, and they took reports from the Jersey police and so forth. Um, Philip Mangano was murdered and left floating in a bay. Uh, the accepted killer is Albert Anastasia, but this report offers you know, different versions of what, uh, what could have happened, why he may have been killed. Um, you know, not relevant here, but when you read anything about Alvin Anastasia and his brother, uh, remember this, the media really disliked him, the New York media and the uh, national media, the intellectuals said the Democrat, the left really disliked him. Uh, they were pushed on by labor people because the, the Anastasia was really sucking the blood out of people who worked on on the waterfront, and so the media made sure he got a black eye whenever they could give him one. Anyway, back to the point at hand. Here's the facts before I tell you what the report says. On April 19, 1951, uh, Mrs. Mary Goch, G-O-O-C-H, uh, interesting woman. I read some other things about her. It doesn't matter here, but she was a Brooklyn uh, fishing boat owner. She operated one as well. She left her home around 10 o'clock in the morning took a shortcut across the marshes to Bergen Beach, which is near Avenue Y and East 72nd Street in Southeast Brooklyn. Apparently now, though, uh, it's a, a field or a park or something. Uh, anyway, it, in a tall clump of grass, Goats looked across and saw a pantless, shoeless body of Phil Mangano, sprawl face down. There was a big diamond pinky on it. It's a big diamond ring on his pinky. And he'd been shot three times with a forty five caliber. It looked to be a punishment murder. They shot him in the left cheek of his face, right cheek of his face, and then at the base of the neck where it meets the skull. They had to have a closed coffin. I think that was probably the entire point of shooting him that way, would be my guess. He had to be identified from fingerprints. He had no face left. Uh, oddly enough, by the way, this lady, Gooch, in 1949, uh, it says uh, she lived on Avenue X. Isn't that a great name? Avenue X. She found the strangled body of a police officer's wife more or less in the same area. I mean, <laughs> right off, she's going to be my suspect in both of these murders. But uh, I checked from 1945, this happened in 49, I read, but I checked from 49, uh, 45 through 54, I couldn't find any mention of it, but that just means I couldn't find it. Uh, anyway, police determined that Phil Magano was shot elsewhere. They used a rope to drag him into a car, drag him out of the car, and leave him on the beach. They found the, they found the uh, rope near the body. He'd been dead for 20 hours. His wife said that coincided with the time she left him. They had been shopping in Bay Ridge, and then he said he had to go make a phone call, get a cup of coffee, and that was the last she ever saw him. Bagano's lived at 1126 84th Street in Bay Ridge in Brooklyn. I know some of you like to have that information. On paper, anyway, he was the owner of a laundry, a big commercial laundry. His brother, of course, was Vincent Mangano. He's the leader of New York, one of the original five mafia families set up by Maranzano in 1931. Salvatore Maranzano. The Mangano's uh, boys were born in Palermo and they moved to Brooklyn in 1917-ish. Uh, Vincent was older, we, I didn't know this, by about a dozen years. I had no idea he was that much older than that. Uh, Vincent was the brains in this operation. He was uh, cool-headed. Uh, he was respected within the mafia. He, uh, I read this too. He was admired for his cooking abilities. He could make fish dishes. And they said he got fresh fish brought in from the waterfront docks uh, that he ran. He owned docks basically um, I don't know if I'd eat a fish from the water from the dock, but anyway uh, they were both important figures there in, in, on the Brooklyn waterfront uh, they controlled extortion, hijacking loan sharking, uh, later on of course Albert Anastasia was the boss there for a long time in addition Vincent uh, Montgomery ran a lot of gambling in lower Manhattan, he had a lot of stuff going on there he was also, he meddled around in Democrat Party uh, politics in South Boston. Uh, he had a police record that dated to 1919, a couple of charges of manslaughter. Phil Mangano listed his job, uh, his other job, as treasurer. 
for a Brooklyn ship painting company. He had been arrested eight times starting in 1918. There was one charge in 1923, it was dismissed, uh, that while he was working as a bodyguard for Frank Yale, he had helped him murder a Manhattan bootlegger named Giovanni Piccaro, a member of the Palermo mob who moved back who moved to uh, New York. And then we've got, in September of 1935, he was suspected of killing uh, Joe Amberg and Maury Kessler, the Amberg brothers who were in a garage in Brownsville, Brooklyn. He, 19, I missed one, in 1924, he was arrested in Buffalo in an attempted murder of this guy, Joe Patitucci, who was a government informant. There was this huge uh, narcotics thing going on in Buffalo. They were dealing dope. One of the guys involved there was John J. Mangano. I, I don't know if there's a relationship or not. Mangano was a druggist, and he apparently was supplying these drugs. So why Phil Mangano would go all the way to Buffalo out of Brooklyn, I don't know. Uh, imported killer. But there were other people involved. Uh, uh, the, the word is that uh, Phil may have been his brother's underboss, he may have been a family advisor. Other people have told me that he was just too dumb to be an advisor, but the consigliere, in other words. And, um, as for the underboss, not vicious enough, but that his uh, Anastasia may have been the other boss. It's not certain, so who knew, you know, they didn't write these things down, unfortunately. But in 1940, the Italian Treasury Police, the Federal Treasury Police, reported that the Mangano brothers sat on a nine-member Grand Council of Sicilia Mafia in America. Interesting. Uh, they may have been referring to the commission. I, I don't know. Uh, police rounded up after the murder, Phil's murder, they rounded up the usual suspect. They dragged in Adonis Anastasia, Frank Costello, Tony Goebbels, uh, Gatnino Aricia, uh, I'm going to mess it, Gionchino, Sparacino, Tony Springs, he was called, Joe Adonis. Joe Adonis, he said, well, you know, Mangano was a womanizer, and he'd been sleeping with some mafiosos' wives, and so he was killed. That doesn't seem to have any ground to it at all. Now, this, let me go back to this um, Sparacino guy, uh, Tony Springs. His bullet-ridden body turned up uh, in the Bath Beach area in Brooklyn. Him and uh, Jimmy Scalente were more than probably were more than probably the killers in this case. They are uh, generally accepted they were the actually hands-on killers. Uh, a theory making the rounds in this paper was that Phil was murdered to keep him from talking to the U.S. Senate Committee, the Keefoff Committee, that was just getting started. Uh, then, of course, there's the in inevitable story that he was killed for secretly meeting with the Kefauver guys. I don't think that's true. Um, Mangano's 22-year-old son, who I think is now an attorney at law, was became an attorney at law, told prosecutors that Phil was Phil Mangano was killed because he was trying to pull away from the mafia and that he had made two trips down to Virginia to buy a construction firm and he was just going to uh, throw it all away. Uh, I don't know, you know, these guys usually don't wander too far from home. Uh, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree, as they say. Uh, the, one explanation that the police had, it's mundane, but, it, you know, it's doable. Mangano, they said, was extorting money from the wrong people. According to this theory, he defied gang orders by go that they, everyone would leave these prominent Italian guys, businessmen alone guys who walked down the straight and narrow path and the community was proud of them. Um, he was extorting them. So they went to Joe Profacci and Profacci went to Vincent Magano and said, this has got to stop. And Vincent said, well, what's happened is Phil's been losing a lot uh, to bookies. He's in a lot of trouble over losses at the racetrack. He gambles, he can't stop, blah, blah, blah. So Profacci said, well, it's got to add, I don't care. It doesn't work that way. Um, he said, Profacci said, according to the police, that it made him look weak in front of the eyes of these prominent attendants. And he wanted to be a part of that. You know, a lot of these big, big-time mobsters in New York, anyway. Tony Arcota is another, Arcado, sorry, is another example of, you know, they all wanted to pass over after they'd gotten a certain amount of money that had been around. They wanted to just, Frank Costello was notorious, but they wanted to be respectable and just say, nah, I wasn't really a gangster. Uh, and so it made Profaci look weak. Was, um, he said, anyway, told him, knock it off. And uh, 
when he didn't, when he robbed uh, a Brooklyn bakery of five grand, five grand, 1951, a good deal of cash. Uh, they said, that's it. And uh, uh, this, I don't know. Profaci ordered him killed, but Vincent Magano gave assurances he wouldn't interfere with Profaci's justice. I don't know. It doesn't sound like, who knows? Anyway, uh, no one came to Phil Magano's funeral. Uh, Magano's brother-in-law, Constantino Gust Scavenevino, was married to their sister, Provencia. Uh, he was another water waterfront thug. He sent out word that the funeral's off limits, don't come, don't whatever. Uh, the funeral was held on April 23rd, just four days after they found him. The only mourners were the Scavenzinos, the, the brother-in-law, and Girolamo Magano, his third brother, and his family. I said it was a closed coffin because of the shooting on the face. The press wanted to be a part of it, uh, but the family moved quick. The hearse left Boyertown Chapel at 38 Lafayette Street, Lafayette Street, I'm sorry, a half an hour before the scheduled time uh, to avoid reporters. There were no church services. Uh, Vincent Magano was not at the funeral, as we all know. He had gone missing uh, the day his brother disappeared. His body was never found. He was legally declared dead in 1961. In all probability, again, Elman Anastasia, ambitious, uh, maybe not all there in the head. He just got tired of waiting to be the boss, and he made his move and hurried things along by killing the Magano brothers. I don't know. I don't think anyone can say what he that they do know. Chris, I'm so happy you have so many wonderful new friends. He was very unpopular in high school. Oh, yeah, you know, he's strong, too. He takes care of a lot of stuff for us. Stuff? Yeah, he, he took care of one of our competitors. Mr. Firestone says hello. Ow! 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 Stop it! Stop it! Oh my god, Chris! That's silly, but it's still murder! Relax. That Michelin man had no family. He came from tires, Ma! Did you spend last night? Oh, don't you hear? 